how do you feel about the, 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 those two sides of yeah. the identity of an artist? Oh, it's funny. I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of like to think that yeah, you shouldn't have to be kind of one or the other. I like the idea of just being an artist. And I mean, it's interesting because you know, when I sort of transition from being an animator into, I guess it sort of almost went through kind of experimental film, really. That was, you know, I started off as an animator, and then, I mean, even my, my animations weren't very really narrative at all. It wasn't like narrative was ever really there. It was more in that kind of uh, young Schweinmeier kind of David Anderson mode of sort of moving objects and kind of poetry of motion itself. But then as I, and this was in the kind of mid-90s, and you know, new media, the Australia Council had just changed their name from what was it, intermedia arts to new media, and suddenly there was all this money available, and so that was just like, I mean, obviously I kind of beat one straight into that. But then, yeah, I never really felt that attached to it, to be honest, because it was so, um, it was so technology-driven. I mean, I'm a, I'm a technology lover. You know, I, I use a lot of technology to make these things. And I'm very into um, I make my own kind of robotic devices to make movies. But they're very much tools to get to the, the work that I want to make. And so I'm about the tool. And so, yeah, I've always sort of felt slightly uh, hesitant on it, you know, attaching myself to it. Label. And it's curious actually because having come back, I was just in Linz last month for the, uh, for the Ars Electronica Festival and that was kind of interesting because it's so media art, <laughs> so media art focused. Um, it was, yeah, it was kind of a, it was an interesting experience actually to sort of actually really feel quite a separation from that. So, right, yeah. so perhaps you didn't quite identify it. No, not at all. It was, there was a lot of there was a lot of media and not a lot of art. Right. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you could say a little bit about the works that you are showing in Singapore. Yeah. So that was how you arrived at these works. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll start. Maybe I'll start with these two guys here. Um, these both have sort of come out of a, a project that I started a couple of years ago now. Um, Melbourne, both, both shop in Melbourne. Um, Melbourne's very kind of known for its laneways, or it likes to think it is. I mean, I think a lot of cities don't have laneways, so uh, maybe it's slightly misguided. But um, I, living in Melbourne, spend a lot of time walking up and down these laneways, riding past these laneways. And yeah, I started to see the laneways as these slices that had been taken out of the material of the city. So a lot of the kind of key strategy in a lot of my earlier work was slicing up mainly the video frame and then trying to recombine those slices to form new holes or new possibilities. And yeah, I really started looking at these slices in the city and thinking about, oh well, well I first of all was actually thinking about, you know, what were those slices, you know, what was actually there, like these tiny little thin buildings that had been removed, kind of like, like this little, I actually was kind of the idea of trying to recreate the little micro buildings that should have been there. Then I actually started thinking about the slices as being these negative spaces and would it be possible in the same way that I've been recombining slices of the video frame to take these negative slices of the city and recombine them into a, another possible whole or another, an alternative, yet equally valid structure. And the first work was called Parallel Gar uh, Garden of Parallel Paths, and what that was was actually me tracking past the outsides of the laneways and then sticking them all, sticking them all together, kind of like a, a stack of, of, of laneways with this tiny little thin, much like meniscus, it was like a theatre flat, so all the walls were these tiny little, just wafer thin, one pixel thin, most invisibly thin joiners between them all. And then I was really very interested in the, the, the slice or the crossover point where people would intersect with each other. And it was, uh, it was made for a sort of semi-commission, <laughs> so half commission.
Commission, the Commission Without the Money Commission, <laughs> for, the, uh, for the Adelaide Biennial. And the title of the Adelaide Biennial was Parallel Collisions. So it was this, it was kind of perfect because it was you know, these, all these parallel laneways, but then these kind of collisions at the intersection. And then following that piece, I think a real commission, like real commissions, from, um, from the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne to make a new work at the end of last year. And I proposed to them something that I'd also been thinking about for a long time, which was this idea of trying to connect the laneways together into one just continuous <coughs> sort of infinite tracking shot. And so I went out and uh, yeah, shot, I shot almost 200 laneways, I think. And then in that piece, what I did was create like these little kind of portal, almost they, they had this very kind of mirror quality actually. When you approach a mirror, you know, you see the kind of the same reflection back, but then as you got up to it, you'd actually sort of break through it. And yeah, so it was kind of it was quite a mesmerizing piece actually. But as I was working on that piece, I was exploring all these different ways that you can combine and stitch or link together discontinuous spaces to form a, a, a singular whole or a new whole. And these two pieces were a kind of outcome from that process. So on the right, yeah, I don't have any left or right group in my head, I have to check which one I have my watches on. Um, we have the, the hard cut version, so literally just jamming everything together. I mean, I'm, as an animator, I love sort of single frame animation, and there's a couple, a couple of brief moments in here, so we get those interesting single frame moments. But so yeah, really, it was, this this was simply about trying to find a rhythm. Here we go, we don't need to go to the um, where you would it was short enough to have the almost like uh, um, oh god, good. did you still have the sensation of continuous movement? Right? Yeah, or sort of persistence of vision is what you're looking for, so that you would kind of get the sense that it's a single laneway, but yeah, long enough that you would see them as individual laneways. And that was quite an interesting process of waxing and waning. What was what was that rhythm? In the end, we came down to it. Down to it's five frames, so each video is five, and each snapshot is five frames long. So you just it's incredible actually. You only really need three to get a sense of movement. You know, one obviously just looks like still frames, but even though because they are still moving, you still kind of get the sense of movement. But um, yeah, and I really, I mean, the other thing I was sort of playing with in this one is kind of pick out moments like obviously the start of the end, you have these. It's kind of opening and closing moments, and uh, as you sort of move into the wall. Well, it's interesting. Yesterday, we had someone in the gallery say to you, "Oh, they're stills, aren't they?" Yeah. Um, and, and it made me think. Well, we have this. There is a kind of a genre in, I guess, in popular culture, of a sort of photo flashback. Uh, you know, in the sense of yeah. accelerated flashback. Thing. Yeah. But actually, they're all discrete pieces of moving image, not not stills at all. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's curious to me because I've been so long sort of surfing that border trying to get it just right, and then someone's like, doesn't even see the movement at all. Right. Really? Wow. Oh. Here I was thinking I'd lean a little bit too far towards movement. But, um, yeah, it's, it is good, you know, for me to tell what people are going to take from things. And then, and then the second piece is almost like a counterpoint to this one where it's these incredibly slow fades, so we 12 second fades between at any one point you're, you're actually seeing three, three of them and what I really like in this one is nothing ever fully resolves itself, you never get to hang on to one particular space which yeah, I mean, I kind of like, I mean, all of these pieces, you know, I'm, I'm very kind of uh, attached to the multiple worlds interpretation of the universal theory of everything, that you know, we are actually just experiencing one possibility, and 
and uh, all the others are you know, branching out at the same time. And I kind of like this. Yeah, you can't quite touch it, you can't quite get it. Are they the same, they're all different laneways to the laneways in this work, or is there some crossover? No, there's, there's a lot of crossover. I think pretty much all these laneways are in this one. Yeah. But uh, this one has a few extra tips, this one has a kind of compression. It's a sort of if you think about Star Wars and all the walls coming in, um, just working with the idea of grabbing a steel frame with layer in hand and moving it in the compact and <laughs> throwing that in there is to freak people out. Oh, just a very small portion. It's basically right in the city and then uh, kind of northern suburbs of Carlton. I was living in Northcote at the time, so there's a few Northcote ones in there as well, but it's like the older centre, and there's a few Richmond, Elfington, and Collingwood, but yeah, and the search, the search for the tiny lanes, I actually, I'm just going to put on my website and Google Maps, and I've got these, I love them, they're highly annotated printouts from Google, Google Maps, or you know, laneways, and they put the text, and they're like, put triple text. Like when you, when you really find one, it's like, oh my god, this is the one. Like when I, yeah, you can't, what, what you can't are you really looking see it. What makes it the one? Well, the tiny ones. This you can't quite see it here. It's like my favorite lane in Melbourne is this one beside your moto. It's a Japanese restaurant, and it's this literally it's this wide. It's, you, you, like two people can't go down at the same time. Quite often, you'll be walking up and you'll see someone coming up and walk back to let you out so they can come in, which I find kind of. You know, in this day and age of must be two meters wide for safety exit, cannot put sculpture there because of safety exit. <laughs> Yet we've got this crazy unsafe little laneway, but I was trying to find partners for that laneway because I think it's said one. And uh, they are very few and far between. You know, I found there's this mother load of them in Richmond where it's about, well, there's two, then they like cross over, so it's essentially four really long, super thin lane lines. You see this one shot here where it's double kind of cladding, and that was one of them. Yeah, finding those. Now, I'm doing a lot of searching on Google Maps, and then Street View, but there are a few you can't actually get to on Street View because the car never went down there. So you actually have to go there in person, hit them for a bit. And then getting there, it's just like, oh my god, it's perfect. Yeah, this is the perfect one. <laughs> They were good moments. So actually, I mean, it's interesting, it also brings up uh, questions about the use of public space and, and urban planning, I guess. Um, something that in the, we were talking yesterday about how Daniel's work recalls some earlier moments in, in the history of video practice. And around about the same time, in fact, Gordon Matter Clark is doing uh, projects involving leftover spaces in, in Manhattan. Yeah. Spaces that have been kind of missed out in the zoning and in the apportioning of real estate. Um, and so there's, a, there's also an urban history here as well, because Melbourne, of course, has Melbourne perhaps, like you say, perhaps a little self consciously has uh, turned its laneways into a real um, product in a way. This is yeah. a real kind of uh, tourist and leisure. Um, sort of plus of Melbourne is the way that the laneways in the city have been developed into, you know, cafe strips and bars and restaurants and so on. So. But at the same time, they're being completely colonised as well. Like there's, even in the process of shooting these, I found a couple that were more or less no longer. They're about to be colonised by you know, large department stores. And right. So you're approached on by yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. And a lot of the ones in the, in the suburbs as well, as well are the, uh, the result of, what is it, uh, aggravated possession? No, it's a really sort of violent term, but whereby you basically put a, a fence there right, and convince people it's yours for 17 years, I think it is now, and then it becomes yours. Right. Yeah. But you basically, if you can get away with breaking the law for 17 years, you get rewarded with ownership.
show. It's crazy. It's kind of interesting because I actually looked into the block next to us is empty. And it's been empty forever. It's yeah. like, it's mm, mm, the long. Yeah, how, 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 how much squatting do we have to, you know, if we put a veggie patch there, or well, how long does it have to be there before we can find it out? It's like 17 years. Ah, it's a little bit long. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about the about the hoodie piece. Yeah, yeah. The, the walking man. Okay, so I mean a little bit kind of related to these guys in terms of this path following. Um, I think probably you know at the at the root of it all, basically, I'm just a geometry nerd. You know, big part of all of this work for me is really about geometry, not only a geometry of space, but a geometry of time and. Um, I, for a long time, have been getting into this particular branch of graph theory known as Hamiltonian paths, or the, yeah, the traveling salesman problem. And I actually first came to that, I sort of come to it through a number of, sort of pathways that I intended. But it was actually a portraiture project where I was trying to program a robot to take these very sort of large kind of almost like uh, Google map, Google Earth pictures of people's faces. And so I, was using, I needed to program the camera to get to every place on the grid. So imagine this sort of like a chuck close grid of a face. And I'm zoomed right in to so little micro moments. And I started off with these sort of snake like grids, and then I was starting to explore other, because they're all um, very, very time based, so it would take, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes to take the portrait. The whole idea is that you know, it would get very kind of messed up, it's more about the time of the person and getting a sort of alternate portrait of them. But through that process, I needed to find a way, I was and there has to be some kind of mathematical model for traversing all the points in that grid in the most efficient way that is kind of random as well. So it's not just the snake or a spiral, it has to be some kind of, and then of course I started maybe trying to do it myself, and it's like very quickly, it's like, oh my, this is well beyond my mathematical skills. So I actually, this is one of the few times I've ever done it, I did the complete cold call, I walked into the maths department at Melbourne Uni, I literally just walked up to the reception desk, it's like, I have got a problem, I think it has something to do with mathematics, and I'm pretty sure there's someone here who can help me. Can you point me in the direction? And after about a day or so, I actually found some people, and yeah, it was amazing. Then I found out, oh yeah, yeah, Hamiltonian paths. Oh no, that's that's one of the big problems in maths. It's like, oh, great, great. Yeah, I've been sort of thinking about doing these telephone books of these paths. Turns out, yeah, this, it, it, it's, it's an NP-complete problem. So what that means is that it's directly proportional to, there's no quick way of solving it, if you just have to crunch the numbers, and I think currently... So what, what is it? It's oh, okay, so a Hamiltonian path is, imagine you've got a grid of points on a graph, I mean a grid that is any, any kind of graph it, it applies to, but it's the easiest one is to think of as a grid of points, and then how do you cross each point without intersecting yourself or missing any out? And, yeah, how do you touch every spot once? Yeah, how do you go to every city? I mean, the travelling salesman problem, how does the, the, the shoe salesman visit every uh, state capital in the United States only once, and what's the most efficient way of doing that? And actually, um, oh, what's his name? A uh, British artist just did a project in the, um, in, the, in the tube stations where he put a different labyrinth in each tube station. But curiously, yeah, Brian, come back to me. Does that ring a bell for you, Nina? Like it's a commission. Yeah. Yeah. commission. yeah. Oh, very famous yeah. British yeah. artist. Yeah, he's made a kind of video. Um, no. Anyway, <laughs> we'll come to me later. But it's kind of curious because that's actually quite a famous traveling salesman problem. What's the quickest way to get to every tube station? You know, using the trains. And, and recently, I think some guys said it in 19 hours or something. Like, and what's the quickest way? So, but he did 
making for every set. So anyway, I, di I digress. Um, so the Hamiltonian part. So I became very kind of interested in, in, in the path. It has all these really kind of interesting uh, associations, like the original algorithms were actually developed for protein folding, and working on protein folding sequences, and I ended up, yeah, we ended up talking to some guy, a Dutch guy who's now living in Brazil, who is the kind of leading expert in this area, and he was the guy who developed the main algorithm that's used to search for these paths, so that was kind of a cool moment, but I really, Love them. I mean, for a number of reasons, um, I'm really interesting. But one of the things I found particularly interesting is that because they are a single path, they form labyrinths. Now, labyrinths, as opposed to mazes, mazes are designed to confuse and mislead. Whereas labyrinths are, some, well, the traditional, you know, the original idea of a labyrinth is actually a single path. And if you go to places like, I mean, the, the most famous one is the Shaft Cathedral, and it's it's kind of a, it's a, a, a tool of pilgrimage. You know, I mean, it was meant to be about you know going to the Holy Lands, but you know, couldn't. So you go to the cathedral, walk the labyrinth, and you know it's kind of like a, a pilgrimage standard. And then we also had this sort of like, quite like you know, like the Hajj, like this sort of circling kind of pilgrimage into the middle of the black stone and then back out again this kind of swirling mess and so and of course you know the whole kind of cyclic nature I mean a part a, a Hamiltonian path can also be a Hamiltonian cycle if it meets up with itself so then it becomes this sort of hermetic loop and I was really interested in that idea and so this piece that, that's what this piece is so um, we have this character sort of Hooded, sort of slightly monastic, slightly hoodlum, <laughs> urban vagrant flaneur who comes in and starts walking this cycle, starts walking this uh, Hamiltonian cycle, and then more and more copies of himself come in until it forms this, yeah, hermetic cycle where he does this kind of churning, never ending loop. Kind of the it occurred to me when we were preparing the show that um, I, I haven't had time to do the research for this. <laughs> that it, you know, Singapore itself is uh, a, a product of Hamiltonian thinking. Um, the, the history of this city is, is very much bound up with its uh, strategic position on trade routes and. Uh, yeah. The ability of the, the logistics industry to function here much more efficiently than in other places, partly yeah, because yeah. of administration and partly simply because of its geographic position uh, and its kind of you know, historical makeup has allowed a certain sort of trade to happen here. Um, so I think it's a very it's a it's a very apposite work to be showing here. I don't know how kind of bring yeah, that yeah, up. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a good one, isn't it? I mean, it's the ultimate kind of travelling traveling salesman it solution. No, it really is. But also, I think what, what comes along with it is culturally is the opposite, because Singapore, at the same time, is very self-conscious about the fact that it is an entirely modern and an entirely produced place. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it produces distance. As part of its urban planning, Singapore deliberately makes curves so that yeah. things feel further apart. You know? yeah. So it's actually the, the contrary as well. At the same yeah, yeah, time. yeah. It's interesting. Why did you choose that position? Um, it was, well, I was looking, I mean, I'm, I'm just very attracted to kind of uh, urban spaces. And originally it was actually, I was looking at a couple of sort of derelict kind of industrial space on the outskirts of Melbourne. But, yeah, I mean, it was partly driven because of production um, necessities. It was all going to be shot with a green screen originally. But the problem with the green screen is that it, we were going to run around, you know, we did all these experiments, I had two friends with it, we made this big green screen and running around behind them as he walked. And it works really well. Like the green screen is phenomenal. The green screen technology these days is incredible. 
problem was the green screen itself was cast in such a shadow and, and all this kind of green tinge and stuff that it just, yeah, it became a real, became really problematic. Then I looked into possibly shooting it in a, in a green screen studio and just having it in a void, like not having the background at all. I kind of like the idea of almost having just this kind of matrix-like void. But the luck with I just couldn't get into any of the green screen studios that were being used by uh, Hollywood production facilities, Melbourneians, Mexicans with mobiles. Um, and then, so then it became about, okay, we have to find some place that is lit. I mean, I kind of have had a slight obsession with car parks for the last few years and I've been looking for an excuse to shoot one. And this, yeah, this one just really, I mean, it, it kind of ticked a lot of boxes. And so, Ended up causing quite a few problems as well because we had the green screen not only cast shadows in here but because the lighting was so different, it was just a total nightmare. So we know actually this has been entirely rotoscoped by hand, so he's been cut out of every single frame. He's several thousand frames. It's like you know, a complete nightmare, but that's kind of the size of the point. Yeah, it's a lot of work to make it. Yeah. This is another thing that I've always found very interesting about your work. Um, the, the kind of new media art that we were talking about before is, is very often, at least for you know, for most people's understanding, it's it's, it's thought of as a machine-made object. You know, the, the, the image is made by computers or yeah. by machines, but in fact. The media artists that I knew, uh, you know, were basically the most manual artists <laughs> around in a lot of ways, and I think the digital has often been misunderstood like that. Do you feel about your work that it's a, that it's very much a kind of hands-on process? It sounds very laborious. Oh, it's incredibly laborious and menial. I mean, I think you know, I always used to say that. I mean, we'll. Two points I'd make is one, you know, a lot of stuff that was written about the work, especially early on, was this kind of digital wizardry. You know, it was all amazingly digital. But the thing I always used to say was, it's not inherently digital at all. You could be making this with film if you really wanted to. If you really wanted to get out a scalpel and slice tiny little bits together, perhaps you know, hire some developing village or developing nation. To, to just work on it for a month, you could do it that way. So it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't something that could never be made any other way. Um, but yeah, and the other thing is, it is incredibly manual. And even like in these recent sculptural works that I've been doing, you know, the whole idea is that they are the sort of direct, direct from reality to objects, this direct translation, which sort of implies, you know, a perfect kind of computer, un untouched, transition from the real world to the real world, but you know, like a month and a half with sanding involved. You know, somebody got out the sandpaper for a month and a half. Which, I mean, that was extremely analog, like real analog, not just analog on a computer. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's funny, because, I mean, I, these works couldn't be made, I mean, they could be, but, forever without a, quite a degree of coding. But all that coding is basically just automation. Autom automation and human error removal. I mean, you know, I mean, just even having software to rename files is incredibly helpful. I mean, when you have to name 1500 files with the right name, you can just hit a button, or you know, in my case, you can spend sort of three days working out how to write the code to hit the button when you would have just done it by then, probably in you know, four hours if you wanted to sit down. But uh, yeah, that, that's that's where the that's where the computer really comes into it. It's more as a labor-saving device, I guess. Yeah, which is, you know, but is it important to you that your work is? I mean, you you mentioned before this is a distinction in. in media theory that they talk about a lot, right? Medium 
specificity. Yeah. Am I making something that only this digital machine can do, or yeah. is it just another version of, of an older form? Is, is it important to you to be doing something that's really specific to your tools? Um, or is it more about the outcome? Well, it's... I mean, these, you know... George Melier could have probably made books, you know, there's, there's, in that sense, not at all, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the outcome, it's nothing to do with the, uh, with the, the method of how it's created, but on the other hand, it's very much about video, it's very much about the medium and construction of video, and, you know, I'm, you know, I, you know, I just, it kills me when I see people making videos that have no idea about the medium itself. I mean, it's a little less so these days, but you know, so 10 years ago, if you, you know, if you didn't actually know what you were doing, you could create these videos with sort of field interlacing problems with a nice and go to video shows and stuff, but you're jittering and crazy. It's like, what, what are you doing? It's like a painting show with, you know, painted on the wrong side of the canvas or something. So in that sense, yeah, I, you know, I am very embedded in the in the material of of the moving image, in particular the video of the moving image. Mm -hmm. I'm not the kind of the, the film lover in that sense. It is very much about video. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. No. <laughs> Does anybody else want to ask any questions? So why the departure? Yeah, I think maybe in the sort of the visual outcomes, but I think the the thinking and the kind of strategy is all is all the same. It's all coming from the same place. It's all about trying to connect disparate or discontinuous elements into a into a new whole. But, and the thing I always talk about as well is that it's not a different or kind of manufactured whole. It's it, it's topologically valid. It's exactly what was there before. It's just looked at from a different angle. I mean, you know, they're very cut up, but at the same time they're not cut. I and mean, I think it's been edited in the sense they're very much just being looked at from a different angle. And that angle is time. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's I mean that's the, the kind of key strategy really in all of these works is to swapping time for one of the dimensions of space. I mean well, I had this argument with someone else in the world when I was in Les, somebody knows a lot more about the sort of philosophy of time than me, but you know, Einstein kind of was one of the first people to sort of show or kind of girdle was apparently, but that time is an equal valid um, dimension of space, or time is space. Time is just a four dimension of space which we kind of see differently. And yeah, I think that, that, you know, the, big, the big strategy that I use all the time is just swapping out that dimension for another one. So it might be X, might be Y, might be Z. Are you pretty sure what you think that it is
each other. I do love this idea is that you walk through time backwards and you're focused on your ancestors, not on the future at all. But, you know, it's all about where you came from, not where you're going, which I think is, is kind of a beautiful idea as well. And, uh, I, heard, I heard a great thing actually on the radio the other day, which like, really kind of struck me, was uh, economics Nobel Prize winner who became really interested in this idea of memory and the, the economics of memory. And he said, basically, humans, our memories are just how long it was and how it ended. <laughs> Which I, I thought was quite an interesting idea. You know, it's almost like the, you know, the actual efficiency of storage of memory is just like, how long was that event and how did it end? That, that's you know, generally what we store. Which, uh, <laughs> and he kind of he talked about uh, a concert that he was at and uh, something went wrong at the end of the concert and the guy that he was there was just, oh, ruined the whole thing for me. Ruined the whole thing. What do you mean? It was like the last minute, you know? The whole rest of the concert was amazing. So they not ruined it all. It's like, yeah, right, because that's the only left you know, I was there for an hour and the last minute was crap. So the whole thing cracked now. Which I thought, yeah, it's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, duration and ending, that's all you've heard. <laughs> Any other last questions? Or if not, we, we will wrap up. Thank you very much, Danny. And, uh, and please help yourselves to a, a drink or a snack. We've got some, some quay, some local cakes there. Um, knock yourselves out, please. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.